This is a production of WTVI PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact, thousands of refugees and asylees live in Charlotte. We'll take a look at the many challenges they face here. Plus, we visit the John Croslin School, where a one on one approach to teaching kids with special needs is working. And solving problems on the Catawba River. Coming up, we'll take a ride on the water with the river keeper to see some of those problems firsthand. Don't go anywhere. Carolina Impact starts right now. WTBI PBS Charlotte presents Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Funding for Carolina Impact is provided by the members of WTVI PBS Charlotte and by the Philip L. Van Every Foundation is pleased to support our region's arts organizations and artists with profiles and feature stories on Carolina Impact. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. It's officially boating season, my favorite time of year. It's become my favorite pastime here in the sunny south. But even if it's not yours, our rivers play an important part in all of our lives. If you've ever splashed in a lake, clicked on a light bulb, or poured yourself a glass of water, then chances are you've been touched by the Catawba River. You and about two million of your friends. The Catawba covers 5,000 square miles here in the Carolinas, all under the watchful eye of the Catawba Riverkeeper Foundation. The name says it all, keeping the water we depend on from the river clean and safe. Now, this is the second profile of our community give back finalists. Carolina Impact's Jeff Saunier joins us from Lake Wiley Marina with more on the challenges facing the river keepers and some successes. Hi, Amy. Uh, hang on a second. I've got to help cast us off here. You know, the Catawba River is our water source and also our power source. It's a place for boaters to cruise and for the rest of us to take in the waterfront views. But for the riverkeeper volunteers who are out here on the water every day, well, they say what they view is oftentimes not very pretty. You ready, CD? It's the lifeblood of our whole community. Volunteer C.D. Collins guides the Riverkeeper boat out to open water to the lake where he's lived for 55 years. And I want this to be here for myself the rest of my life, but for my grandchildren and their children. It's such a beautiful, natural environment. But the nearest power plants with their huge toxic coal ash ponds have been here on the Catawba even longer. That is water that's coming directly from the coal ash ponds into Lake Wiley. We wouldn't know the, the levels of arsenic and other toxins in this water if it weren't for the Riverkeeper. Sarah Benke didn't find out about the coal ash ponds near her riverfront home until she was diagnosed with cancer. I felt like I had to do everything that I could as a mom um, to protect my kids from that. And Catawba Riverkeeper have been testing the water in this lake, testing the fish that come out of this lake. They've been testing the base of those earthen berms that support the coal ash ponds. They've been doing this day in and day out. They have the education, the expertise to do all of that. They were able to provide me with all the really solid data and information that I needed. Sediment, I think, is, is really the number one uh, pollut pollutant that we need to um, concern ourselves with. Volunteer Ellen Goff joins us on the Riverkeeper boat just offshore from a huge lakefront construction project with wide stretches of red clay mud where acres of tall trees used to be. There is no permit for monitoring and regulating runoff. And runoff can occur from construction sites, it can occur from unstable ground around a home, erosion, it comes down creeks and streams, anywhere that water is literally running off the land. Stormwater from Charlotte makes the river's runoff problem even worse. So does animal waste that makes it to the Catawba from these chicken farms. That's right, all the runoff that, that comes within a basin eventually funnels down into the Catawba River. But Charlie McCrory shows us a shopping center near his home on Brown's Cove that's working with the Riverkeeper. 
carving out big basins to reduce all that runoff. The river keeper had the attention of the city council. So this is a success story? I think so. I think that they did the right construction project here with the right controls and it's resulted in an area that's now could be considered a park. It's been a success story and I think even the geese will agree. Most people don't really think about what happens if their tap was to go dry. That's because below the surface of the Catawba is where the water treatment plants draw billions of gallons that supply millions of homes and businesses. Hard to imagine that supply would ever dry up. But certain trends or projections suggest that, for example, there was one study that says the Catawba River could literally sort of run out of water um, by 2050. Volunteer Michael Lindsay remembers the four-year drought on the Catawba back in the late 90s, leaving his cove here on Lake Norman mostly high and dry, which is why the Riverkeeper also focuses on water conservation. When we have another major drought, the next time we have that drought, it could impact folks in the home. We could have water rationing, right? And we could have water rationing over two, three, four years, right, before the water tables might recover. We don't want to be an organization that just paints bloom and doom, right? We want to be an organization that's helping the community, the, the basin, um, maintain the quality of life that we've got. People are so busy these days and so distracted. Um, it, it takes a advocacy group to keep these issues front and center so that we don't forget that pollution doesn't sleep and violators don't go away and we need everyone's help to protect it. And the Riverkeeper also brings hundreds of kids out here to the Catawba every summer. For them, their classroom is a kayak, a week of splashing around but also a chance to learn about the river that someday they'll inherit. Amy? Thanks so much, Jeff. Next week, we'll feature our third finalist, the Kings Mountain Historical Museum. Remember, voting opens online April 21st and continues for one week. Cast your votes at pbscharlotte.org. Well, the face of Charlotte continues to change. For decades, the city has welcomed thousands of refugees, asylees, and special immigrants as legal residents. They face lots of challenges, like securing a place to live, finding work, and learning English. Carolina Impact's Jeff Rivenbark explains more about the difficulties refugees encounter and some groups that are helping these residents adjust. From cookware and clothing to groceries and religious icons, there's lots to choose from at the Central Market. Owner Kamal Damal talks in his native Bhutanese with customers at a store on Charlotte's east side. His journey to Charlotte comes after years of hardship. They kill, they burn the house, they put fire in everybody's house and the Nepali community, or they force them to out from the country. Kamal was born in Bhutan and forced to leave his homeland due to religious and ethnic persecution by the government. When I was very small, like in six, seven years old, they take my father to the prison. The news that literally crushed him. They gave us a message that our father was killed by a police inside the jail. Kamal's family fled to Nepal in 1990. With help from a UN-supported agency, Kamal's family started the lengthy process of applying to come to the U.S. Kamal says when he arrived, he had big dreams, but little else. I have only $20 in pocket. Since the 1970s, more than 15,000 refugees, asylees, and legal immigrants from 69 countries have moved to the Queen City. In 2014 alone, there were 675 arrivals. Lindsay LaPlante works with refugees through a program at Central Piedmont Community College. These people have been torn from their homes through violence and persecution and they literally had nowhere else to go. Each year, the president and Congress sets limits on how many refugees can enter the U.S. During fiscal year 2015, 70,000 refugees will be allowed to enter. While the government welcomes people like Kamal and his family who have come here legally. Oftentimes that's not what they run into when they get here because there's so much misunderstanding of who is a legal immigrant, who is an undocumented immigrant. Carolina Refugee Resettlement Program and Catholic Charities Refugee Program helps them out with basic needs like housing and transportation. Government support runs out in about three months. That's why they have to find work quickly. I work here in the morning and in the evening. Rupa even holds a second job at a local company. 
While her English speaking skills are good, many refugees who have never spoken English face a far more difficult time adjusting. Hood. 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 Okay. Good. The basement of the Sailboat Bay Apartments leasing office in East Charlotte has been transformed into a couple of makeshift classrooms. On this day, more than a dozen Bhutanese refugees are learning basic English. Pat your legs. This is the first time that they've had access to education. Very often the language barrier really holds them back. Star. Banner. Good job. Tika, what is the name of the national anthem? Just a few miles away, Rachel Humphreys teaches an ESL class at Shamrock Senior Center to a group of students whose English is a little more advanced. My students call me teacher. They say teacher Rachel, so I'm trying very hard to teach them to call me by my first name. But in their culture, to call someone by their title is a huge sign of respect and honor. Humphreys also leads Refugee Support Services, one of the many organizations in Charlotte providing refugees with things they need long term. Goodbye, Bola. See you later. They're not looking for a handout. They're not looking to take advantage of our systems. This community is just looking for someone to help them navigate our systems. They're looking for a culture coach to help them understand our culture so that they can make this community their own. That's why Humphrey started the Fruitful Friend program, which partners Charlotte residents with newly arrived refugees. Spending time together is when I think barriers can be broken down because there can be high levels of understanding each other's cultures. Refugee advocates say this is critical as the face of Charlotte changes. According to Charlotte's Immigrant Integration Task Force, in 1980, less than 1% of the population was foreign born. By 1990, the number rose to about 3%. In 2000, it grew to 12%, and today, it's about 15%. We are an international community. We are becoming a world-class city. The world is coming to us. Back at Central Market, Kamal has emerged as a community leader, someone newly arrived refugees look up to. If they get any problem, they come to my store or they call me or they come to my home and they ask for help. While Kamal and his family work 10 or 12 hour days, they're grateful for what they have and the opportunities living here offers compared to the persecution and refugee camps that were part of their lives for so many years. It's important to remember that they're just, they're just people. They're just people trying to live their lives. We want the people from Charlotte to help us to achieve an American dream in the United States, uh, to make a better life and to, to forget about the past history. One way Kamal hopes to forget the past is by trading his refugee status to become a U.S. citizen. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jeff Rivenbark reporting. Thanks, Jeff. There are a number of resettlement service agencies throughout the Charlotte region, which need volunteers. And if you'd like to help out, you can get details from the Carolina Impact page at pbscharlotte.org. For many parents, the daily routine of taking a child to and from school and completing daily homework assignments can be intense. Imagine if those activities create more stress than usual and your child needs extra support. Carolina Impact Sarah Batista recently visited a school specifically designed for children with learning differences. Here's her story. Uh, the dog is so sweet. Such a good boy. With a little help from a therapy dog and a new place to learn, Braden Rush now has a new outlook when it comes to getting good grades. I feel great and I feel like I've improved a lot. But school didn't always come easily to the 10-year-old. At age eight, Braden was diagnosed with ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, a neurological disorder that affects one's ability to focus and concentrate. He also struggled with writing assignments. Braden's mom, Kathleen, says she noticed his confidence started to diminish and his self-esteem took a hit. He was still getting good grades, which was, which was great, but the main difference we saw was just his stress level. And for a child that young, that can be really heartbreaking for a parent to say. Completing homework became a daily chore and an uphill battle. I'm trying to get him to sit down after he'd been sitting all day and to focus really became a struggle, um, not only for him, but for me, <laughs> who was there doing, you know, trying to help him with it. My old school was um, stressing and it wasn't as, um, it didn't help me and improve. It didn't teach me the way that I need to be teached because that school was like for kids without disabilities. Realizing Brayden needed a different learning environment, Kathleen started doing her own homework. 
and she learned about the John Croslin School, a school specifically designed for children with disabilities. We make a lot of different accommodations based on what the individual students need from the way the building was painted, colors that were used as a calming effect, the type of lighting that we have. The lights are, are made so that they don't buzz, hum, or, or that the light doesn't flicker. A short time after enrolling her son at the John Croslin School, Kathleen says she noticed an immediate change in Braden. He began taking more ownership, and those homework assignments, which used to take hours to complete, became less overwhelming. About eight weeks into school, he would come home, unpack his bag by himself, sit down, do his homework. I wouldn't even have to remind him. I wouldn't have to stand over his shoulder. He's become so much more independent. Braden now makes straight A's, and he's even on the school honor roll. At my old school, I didn't write as good as I did now. I wasn't as neat. I hated math at their school. Now I really like math here. He's doing fantastic here. Felicia Robinson understands Braden's struggle all too well. Her son Jordan was also diagnosed with ADHD and dyscalculia, which causes difficulty processing numbers. Felicia says Jordan's poor performance in school indicated he needed extra academic support. The stress of the situation spilled over into their family life. For the parents, it's, it's also social and emotional because you also don't know who you can trust that information with because you want to protect your child. So. Um, it was very difficult for me and my husband at first and very emotional, but then we get into, you know, gear mode and what can we do to position our child for success. Once Jordan got settled in the John Crosland School, Felicia says his grades began to improve. Now the 14-year-old is on track and dreams of becoming a cartoonist one day. They try to look at the child as an individual and create an environment that helps that child to really be empowered to do what they, what they feel they want to do. It's been great education. I really enjoyed the teachers and they teach us new stuff and they are super smart and they are really well educated like us, like we are. Atlantic. Atlantic. Jennifer Nichols says the school combines specialized curriculum and technology to engage students. To watch them get excited and realize, wow, I can do this. I can do math. I didn't think I could, but I can. And I can decide what I want to do. And I feel good about me. And hey, I'm pretty smart. And to watch that process over time and to watch them become more confident, bolder, begin to choose things, begin to follow their passions, it excites me every day. But attending class here isn't cheap. Tuition can cost up to $20,000 annually. A number of the students here receive financial aid, and most parents agree their child's academic success is worth the financial sacrifice. Two-thirds of those families never thought they would be paying for secondary education. And so it's very difficult, and many of them raid retirement funds, they sell their homes, they do the things that they need to do, take on extra jobs, and it's very difficult. The school will eventually have capacity for 250 students, but Nichols says the need is much greater. We could use many schools like this, but it requires funding. Until more schools like John Crosland become available, Kathleen says it's important for parents to understand their child's learning style. For the parents out there that have children that are in a school now that may be struggling and they've been on the fence, you know, where do I look? I would say just start doing your research, visit schools, get to know your child. Um, there's always financial aid available at schools. For Carolina Impact, I'm Sarah Batista reporting. Thanks so much, Sarah. Joining me now is Dr. Sean Preston, head of school at the John Crosland School. Dr. Preston, thanks so much for your time. How are you? Thank you, Amy. I'm doing great. You know, it really is exciting to see a school like yours making such an impact on these students that sometimes struggle in the public school situation. Help us understand how it is so successful for you. Well, there's a couple of really important points to, to, to um, identify for the John Crosland School. Number one is that we have a wonderful assistive technology platform at our school. That platform is called the Odyssey Project. And the Odyssey Project allows us to, to, um, to have a blended learning platform for all of our students. The devices are tailor-made for each child, so the software that they need is on that device. Uh, the teachers have access to all the student software on that device, and the students take the device home and access all the digital curriculum from home and from school. And you're 
classroom sizes are a little smaller than public schools as well, aren't they? They are, about six to ten kids. And that's really what we need to help these students with learning differences be successful, correct? That's correct. It's the least restrictive environment. And, and all schools, I believe, in good faith, uh, strive to have the least restrictive environment for their students, especially LD students. Uh, but our school achieves that all day, every day, by having such small classrooms, having highly qualified and trained teachers, um, having um, administrators who are there to support the, the overall education of the student. And uh, as a result, they are in the least restrictive environment all day. You know, talk to us a little bit everyone is always interested or at least intrigued by statistics. And there's a startling statistic that folks who are incarcerated, 78% of people who are in jail and prison mm -hmm. have been diagnosed with a learning difference. That's true. You're offering an opportunity to help these kids be successful before they end up being that scary statistic, and you have a much more positive, exciting statistic to share. We do. 90% of our uh, high school graduates go on to the, uh, the four-year college of their choice. Not just any four-year college, but the one that they choose to apply to and then eventually enroll in. We find that to be a wonderful statistic, that they are able to go and pursue uh, a career of, of their choosing. And, and the LD did not get in the way, is what we say at our school often. Um, so as a result, we feel pretty confident that we're helping to reduce the, the other um, stat that you gave earlier and put more kids into college. You know, but not every student is ready for college right away, so you're starting something very new that's called the 13th year? Yep, yeah, the 13th year of study called the Pathfinder Program. The Pathfinder Program is a, um, a partnership with CPCC, so students all across the state who have graduated from an accredited high school, public or private, um, can enroll in the John Carlson School Pathfinder Program. Um, there they will be um, uh, enrolled in CPCC and can pursue a certificate program of choice or an associate's degree while, this, uh, while having the support to the John Carlson School uh, behind the scenes. So it really is that sort of next step, that hand-holding opportunity mm -hmm. for these students to really get ready for you know, all the challenges that do exist outside in the real world when perhaps they won't be given the special assistance that they're able to have at the John Croslin School. That's absolutely correct. They'll go on to, to pursue a certificate program, associate's degree, maybe a four-year college degree after that, but have us in the backdrop help them with their homework, their assignments, navigate the course schedule, um, communicate with CPCC as needed. Um, we think it's just a wonderful partnership and it's the first of its kind in North Carolina. It's very exciting. Are you able to accommodate the need for education for students with learning differences in your school? We are. We, we, we are hitting a home run these days with, with the students that come to our school. We're able to give them the least restrictive environment, some of the best assistive technology you can find, and the most highly qualified and trained teachers that, that you can find as well, and just an overall feeling of concern and passion for our students. Are you able to handle the demand, I guess, it might be a better question. Is there so much more need than you can, that you can accommodate at this particular time? We're able to keep pace at the time, but it's, it's challenging. We're having to build additional classrooms every year to accommodate our growth, which we're very excited about. Um, our school is equipped to serve up to 250 students. We're fully um, built out, which we're very excited about as well. Um, but yes, at this point, we're able to, to match the growth, but it's been a challenge. Dr. Sean Preston, head of school at the John Croslin School, thank you for all you're doing to help level the playing field for these great kids. Thank you, Amy. Well, you know what? Finally tonight, we're going to talk about Dances of India. It celebrates culture. More than 30 dancers perform 3,000-year-old classical Indian dances brought to life by dance dramas, costumes, and masks. Senior producer Rick Fitz recently attended a rehearsal and gives us this little sneak peek. Dances of India. Right we started hand. this because Left our hand. Charlotte community okay. is becoming an international community. Okay. And we wanted to make sure that we actually have an opportunity to share what Indian culture is. Because our American culture is a young culture. And how do you bring in this 3,000 year old dance form, 3,000 year old culture, and to the American community? Sate. And so we started Dances of India to ensure that we actually show the dances the way they were thousands of years ago. So my role in this dance with the other girls is to portray traditional folk dances in India. So it's a community dance. It's a dance that portrays when um, at night when we have a festival, we all get together and dance and just celebrate together. So in classical dances, hand gestures are like storytelling sign language. 
So when we represent the characters, we use our hands also to give you the characters. For example, even objects, uh, things like flowers, right? So this is called Lala Padma, and then we put it together, and that becomes a flower. And then if you want to show a tree, there's a name, this is called Tripataka. And then you put it together and cross it, that becomes a tree. So in the classical dance forms, um, one of the main unique features, just like American Indian culture, um, unique features are the bells. Bells are extremely important because you're using your right and left brain when you're performing. You're doing the art side of it, you're doing the math side of it. Every step, every technique is divided into different patterns. So that as a dancer, when they are beating their feet with the bells on, if they make a mistake, you would know that. Unity in Diversity is a signature dance for dancers of India production. Because I have realized, as I have so many international friends from all over the world, I started seeing that there are so many things that we think are different. We are not. We are actually similar. We have the same traditions. So I wanted to each year do research and bring in different parts of the world, different performers, to show how Indian dances, whether it is classical dance or folk dance, have influenced other parts of the world. One thing that this dance especially teaches me is the discipline that we have within the culture so there's a lot of respect that we give to our religion to our elders and a lot of the dances that we do help show that to me it's about bringing a lot of the world's cultures together um, then it kind of shows how different we all can be but how the form of dance can bring us all together and so how show how similar we are as well Thanks so much, Rick. You can see Dances of India Saturday, April 25th at 4 p.m. in Halton Theatre, located on the campus of Central Piedmont Community College. We have ticket information with this story on the Carolina Impact page at pbscharlotte.org. Well, before we leave you tonight, we'd like to invite you to get involved with our program by sending us your story ideas. We know there's all kinds of hidden treasures in your area, and we'd love to hear about them. It's easy to do. Just send us an email with the details to Carolina Impact at WTVI.org. Well, from all of us here at PBS Charlotte, thanks so much for joining us. We hope to see you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. Funding for Carolina Impact is provided by the members of WTVI PBS Charlotte and by... The Philip L. Van Every Foundation is pleased to support our region's arts organizations and artists with profiles and feature stories on Carolina Impact. Production of WTVI PBS Charlotte.